You know, some of the proudest moments of my career have been when I represented women who were in abusive domestic relationships and they were able to escape that relationship and win protection in the United States through asylum law. In fact, there were many instances where I showed up to court and the ICE attorney was ready to agree with my client's claim for asylum, so long as that ICE attorney was able to question my client on the statutory bars to asylum, such as whether she had a criminal record or whether she was a danger to public health or national security. We even had a case from the Board of Immigration Appeals called the Matter of ARCG, and we could use that to help us formulate our strategy on how to define the particular social group and what evidence we needed in order to find it and submit it to the court so we could argue our case either in a pre-hearing brief or even possibly with a telephone chat with the ICE attorney beforehand. But all that stopped around 2016, 2017. My practice had been mostly before the Arlington Immigration Court in Virginia. And one of the factors in the change was that one of the judges who was the most supportive of these types of cases retired. When he did, I knew that the Arlington Immigration Court bar was going to get a rude awakening. Almost immediately, we began to get new immigration judges who treated every domestic violence case with great suspicion. Some of them began treating the respondents as if it were the judge who was responsible to engage in cross-examination. Now, what you may not know is that the immigration bar is a very cooperative community. In fact, with these types of cases, we often share with each other facts, affidavits, names of experts, and other information that we might need in order to help a woman who was a victim of domestic abuse better win her asylum claim. And we would often use these affidavits from experts who were experts in the particular country at issue and it would help us bolster our argument on why that foreign government was either unable or unwilling to protect women who were in abusive relationships. But what began happening is that some of the judges began to pick up on the fact that we were using some of these same affidavits from experts. And then they would take these reports, these affidavits, these studies, and they would pick up some esoteric point, some very obscure point, and they would begin to grill the respondents over that point. Now keep in mind, because these were often poor women from Central America, they didn't have a high school education. And yet, these judges would be quoting technical points from these expert reports and grilling my clients as if they had a PhD in psychology. Other judges began demanding much more evidence on some of the most mundane points in my client's case. Things like the location of the closest medical facility or the exact location of the closest police department. The fact is, there was a very palpable shift on how these newer immigration judges were approaching asylum cases based on domestic violence. And most shocking to me were that the immigration judges were women. Here, we had these women judges who just were not going to give these other women respondents the benefit of the doubt when it came to domestic violence issues. So then Donald Trump was elected, and he most definitely ran an anti-immigrant campaign. So while it was enraging, it wasn't surprising that when Donald Trump appointed his first attorney general, Jeff Sessions, that Jeff Sessions took drastic effort in order to try to shut the door on using asylum law to help women escape domestic violence. So I wanna talk about that and I also want to talk about some recent court decisions that appear to be curtailing some of the administration's efforts to block victims of domestic violence from receiving asylum protection in the United States. My name is William Kovach and I am a trained immigration lawyer. I've often been disappointed in the way immigration issues are talked about in the media, although it's not always their fault. Immigration law can be a very complex subject, touching upon 
constitutional issues as well as personal political points of view. My goal is to explain immigration law to you, concentrating on looking at judicial opinions and executive actions in order to explain how immigration law can have an impact on our community and on our country. I hope that you'll join me as we try to make sense of immigration law and how it may affect the average person. Early in my career as an immigration attorney, one of the most encouraging cases I had was one where I was representing a woman from Central America who was the victim of domestic violence. I took on this case pro bono, meaning I was volunteering my time, and I took a lot of effort into making sure that I built as strong a case as I could for her. Now, there are two major issues in winning an asylum case based on domestic violence. And let's start with considering the standard for asylum protection. In order to be eligible to win asylum in the United States, you have to show a well-founded fear of persecution based on one of the five protected reasons, race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, and political opinion. Now, the first issue is persecution. Have you suffered or do you have a reasonable fear of suffering persecution? Persecution is traditionally seen as an act by the government. And generally speaking, you don't qualify for asylum if the acts of violence were perpetrated by a private individual as opposed to somebody who was working on behalf of the government. That is, unless you had the evidence to prove that the foreign government was either unable or unwilling to offer protection to the abused woman from those acts from a private individual. And there is where you may be able to offer evidence concerning the culture of that particular country and why that culture fosters an atmosphere that allows domestic violence to continue without interference from the government. And then the second issue is trying to fit the reason for the violence into one of the five protected grounds. In particular, we're looking at the category of being a member of a particular social group. This is a term that is not defined by the statute, and the trick is how you define that particular social group. And when I first came into immigration practice, we didn't have a helpful decision from the Board of Immigration Appeals. Instead, what we had were these draft regulations. They dated back to the late 1990s, but they were never finalized. We also had these decisions from immigration judges, which were unpublished and they were redacted, and they were floating around the immigration law bar. Now, decisions from immigration judges are not precedential, meaning they're binding on the parties before the immigration judge, but you cannot use them to say that it creates a rule of law that other immigration judges then have to follow. But you can use them to say, hey, here's some persuasive reasoning that one of your colleagues used in order to grant asylum in a very similar case. And often, these unpublished immigration judge decisions, well, they could help you formulate the particular social group for your particular case. And in the first few cases that I had involving women from Central America who were trying to escape from domestic violence, as long as I did the legwork in terms of doing the research of the culture of the home country and coming up with credible evidence showing that there was a culture of toxic masculinity or machismo and helped my client to draft a personal statement that was detailed and sometimes very graphic, well, then I would have the ICE attorney literally telling me on the day of the hearing that she was not going to contest my client's claim so long as she could question my client on whether or not my client met some of the statutory bars to asylum. 
But then in 2014, we did get a very helpful case from the Board of Immigration Appeals. It was a case that was called the matter of ARCG. I'm using letters ARCG because those are the initials of the respondent involved in the case. With these asylum cases, the courts will keep the identity of the respondent anonymous so it wouldn't create any more danger for the respondent by having their name out in public. Specifically, the BIA found that the particular social group defined as married women from Guatemala who are unable to leave their domestic relationship was an appropriate particular social group for the purpose of winning asylum. So you would use that standard and you would use the BIA's rationale in order to craft a definition of a particular social group that was similar with that and you could come up with your argument and why your definition was appropriate. But as I said, I started seeing a shift in both how the immigration judges and the ICE attorneys were treating these types of cases. They both became more skeptical. And in particular, the new judges that were being assigned to the Arlington Immigration Court, well, they were being more activist in their approach. In many cases, the judges would question the respondents themselves. And while that behavior alone may not itself be any kind of abuse of the judge's position, a judge does have the discretion to ask questions of a witness if he or she sees it's appropriate. But it was from my perspective that I saw that the judges were treating these questions more like they were cross-examination, as if they were trying to find a particular reason to find my client not credible and therefore deny the case. And like I said, this was around 2016, 2017. But then we got a new administration and a new attorney general. And Jeff Sessions in particular had been on record when he was in the Senate of being particularly anti-immigrant and specifically anti-Hispanic immigrant. Sessions had accused Dominicans, for example, of committing fraud in order to file family visa cases. And he did so without even presenting any evidence of it, just bold accusations that Dominican applicants were just coming up with fraudulent documents. One of Jess Sessions' top aides when he was in the Senate was a man by the name of Stephen Miller. And in the new administration, not only did Jeff Sessions get appointed attorney general, but his former aide wound up getting a job in the White House advising the president directly. And quite frankly, if you follow Jeff Sessions' career, then the xenophobic turn of the Trump administration was not at all surprising. And one area that Jeff Sessions specifically focused on as attorney general was in trying to curtail these asylum cases that were based on domestic violence. So along comes a new BIA case, and that was called Matter of AB. And in that case, the BIA reversed a decision by the immigration judge. The immigration judge had denied an asylum case by a woman who was claiming protection based on being a victim of domestic violence. The BIA did so, citing to matter of ARCG. Now, let me take a step backwards for a minute to make sure all of this is in its proper context. When you are in removal proceedings, the immigration judge is the person who gets the first crack at deciding whether a respondent qualifies for asylum. But a decision from the immigration judge can be appealed to the Board of Immigration Appeals. Both the immigration courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals are part of an executive agency called the Executive Office of Immigration Review. It is an agency that is part of the Department of Justice, and this means that their boss is the Attorney General. The Attorney General is the one who hires immigration judges and members of the BIA, and even though immigration judges and BIA members are supposed to be able to exercise independent judgment, the Attorney General 
can put pressure on them based on how they decide their cases. Immigration judge decisions are a lot like federal court decisions. They are only binding on the parties before the judge. And not only that, their decisions are not published. BIA cases, on the other hand, can be precedential, meaning it's possible for the BIA itself to decide that one of its opinions is binding not only on the two parties before them, but also that it creates a general rule of interpretation that is binding on all immigration judges. Indeed, it can even be binding on the Department of Homeland Security. BIA decisions are appealable to the U.S. Courts of Appeal for the various circuits, depending on the location of the immigration court that the case is based on. So, for example, in my situation where I practice in Arlington, Virginia, if one of my cases went to the BIA and then I appealed the case to the circuit court, it would go to the Fourth Circuit, because the Fourth Circuit is the one responsible for Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. But before we get there, the Attorney General has the power, in appropriate cases, to take a case that's been decided by the BIA and make the decision for himself. Now, it's rare when the Attorney General does this, but when he or she does so, that decision is binding on the BIA as well as to immigration judges. And that's what happened in this case called the matter of AB. The respondent in matter of AB sought asylum based on her fear of persecution on being a member of a particular social group. She defined that particular social group as El Salvadoran women who were unable to leave their domestic relationships where they have children in common. And the BIA found in favor of the respondent, as I said, citing the rule from matter of ARCG. But Jeff Sessions was not happy with the outcome, so he used his authority as the Attorney General to take jurisdiction over the case. And Sessions made it clear that his agenda was to make it difficult for someone who claimed to be a victim of a private criminal activity to gain asylum based on his or her membership in a particular social group. He used the opportunity to overrule matter of ARCG and thus place the asylum claims of hundreds, if not thousands, of abused women from Central America in jeopardy. Sessions' main point was that the particular social group must be defined independently of the alleged underlying harm. That is, you couldn't define a particular social group as women from Guatemala who suffered domestic violence. The statute itself does not define what a particular social group is, and BIA precedents state that members of such a group must share a common immutable characteristic. And the BIA has given some examples of what such immutable characteristics could be. They could be sex, color, or kinship ties. It could also be based on a past experience, such as people who are former military leaders, or maybe even landowners. But those characteristics must lead to the group being recognized as a distinct group in the respondent's home country. Now let's talk a little bit of the history of how we got here. Back in 1999, the BIA issued a decision called Matter of RA. This decision denied an asylum claim of a woman from Central America based on domestic violence. But at the time, the Attorney General was Janet Reno. And Janet Reno took jurisdiction of that case, vacated the decision, and remanded it for further proceedings. In the meantime, new regulations were proposed that would have created a clear rule that would have allowed victims of domestic violence in certain cases to qualify for asylum. However, these regulations were never finalized. Nonetheless, 
based on those regulations, a number of government attorneys, a number of ICE attorneys, began conceding asylum cases where the woman was escaping from domestic violence in a society that was extremely patriarchal. In the matter of ARCG, that's exactly what happened. Even though the immigration judge denied the asylum case at the first instance, when it reached the BIA, the government conceded the matter and the BIA published an opinion that recognized married women from Guatemala who were unable to relieve their relationship as a cognizable particular social group. When Attorney General Jeff Sessions took over the matter of AR case, he zeroed in on that fact from the matter of ARCG. Sessions criticized the BIA for not engaging in an independent evaluation of the facts in order to determine whether the proposed particular social group had met all the legal requirements. Jeff Sessions was very clear. It was the fact that the BIA did not engage in this required factual analysis of whether the proposed particular social group met all of the legal requirements of being based on immutable characteristics, on being a separately recognized social group in the society where it came, and on being defined separately from the actual harm that was alleged that led him to overturn matter of ARCG. But Sessions also took the opportunity when he was writing his decision to emphasize that when a person is claiming asylum based on persecution that was not perpetrated by the home government, that that person needed to show that the government was unable or unwilling to give the respondent protection. And based on that, Sessions vacated the BIA's decision in matter of AB. He remanded that case back to the immigration judge for further proceedings. The thing is, Jeff Sessions did not stop there. He went on to offer more pontification. He said that generally, asylum claims based on domestic violence or gang violence would not qualify for asylum as they involved matters of private criminal activities. That is, they were based on violence that were perpetrated by non-governmental actors. Now, Sessions conceded that the activities of private citizens could, in some cases, qualify for asylum, but the fact that the country may have had problems effectively policing certain crimes, or that certain populations were more likely to be victims of those crimes, could not itself establish an asylum claim. And basically, that was an attack on the fact that Central American countries tend to be very chauvinistic, tend to be very patriarchal. He was essentially saying that because those governments were having problems policing domestic violence, well, that should not lead to asylum claims for women who were victims of domestic abuse. Essentially, Sessions was trying to downplay just how pervasive the problem of domestic violence was in the Northern Triangle countries of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. In fact, Sessions claimed that the applicant must show that the government condoned the private actions or demonstrated an inability to protect the victims. Now, these were strong statements, but they were not statements that were necessary to decide the case that was before him. I mean, he had already made his decision based on the fact that the BIA did not engage in a detailed analysis of the facts of whether there was a particular social group. He didn't need to pontificate on what the standard was when a government was unable or unwilling to offer protection. And in the legal field, we call that dicta. Dicta is non-binding. But because the Attorney General is essentially the boss of immigration judges and BIA members, his dicta carried a little bit more weight. 
In fact, I can attest that almost immediately after Jeff Sessions issued the decision in matter of AB, that there was at least one judge on the Arlington Immigration Court that was then issuing an order in her cases where the asylum claim was based on domestic violence saying, hey, attorney, now that we have matter of AB, you need to defend why you're going to keep this case alive, even though the attorney general has said, I've got to deny it. And in fact, this type of pressure that the attorney general can bring on immigration judges and BIA members is one of the arguments for removing the immigration courts from the executive branch and making them true Article Three judicial courts with real independent judges. But the Attorney General's decision actually had even more far-reaching consequences. On the heels of Attorney General Sessions issuing the decision in matter of AB, USCIS, or the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, issued new guidance on how asylum officers should analyze future cases. Now, again, let me take a step back. USCIS has the Asylum Office as part of its agency. The Asylum Office will dispatch asylum officers to, say, the border whenever somebody comes across and is caught by CBP and makes a claim that they fear going back to their home country. The Asylum Officers conduct the Credible Fear Interview, which can be the first step for one of these asylum cases that's in removal proceedings. But if somebody is present in the United States and they're not in removal proceedings, well, then they're applying for asylum through the asylum office. And it's the asylum officers who make the initial decision. So getting back to the guidance, USCIS stressed that officers must analyze each case on its own merits in the context of the society where the claim arises. Nonetheless, USCIS advised that the particular social group must exist independently of the harm asserted. Moreover, when an asylum claim was based on actions that were of non-governmental actors, the applicant had to show the government is unwilling or unable to control such that the government either condoned the behavior or demonstrated a complete helplessness to protect the victim. That was a new way of stating the unable or unwilling to protect standard. And this guidance was supposed to apply to credible fear interviews, as well as the asylum interviews that happened in the asylum office. In the District of Columbia, 12 asylum applicants challenged both matter of AB and the USCIS guidance in the U.S. District Court. And the District Court is the trial court, the court of first instance that gets to decide on issues of federal law. This District Court, which is the District Court for the District of Columbia, issued a nationwide preliminary injunction that prevented the application of the Attorney General's new rule. The judge was Judge Emmett Sullivan. And that preliminary injunction was then appealed by the government to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And this is where we come to the case of Grace versus William Barr. William Barr is, of course, the current Attorney General of the United States, and he was being sued in that capacity. The D.C. Circuit first addressed the issue of this standard condoned and completely helpless it found that this standard was more stringent than the unwilling and unable to protect standard and that the government failed to put forth a rationale for this change in standard. And therefore, the standard was arbitrary and capricious with respect to the requirement of whether a particular social group exists independent of the harm alleged, a rule that the court called the circularity rule, the D.C. Court noted that it's not always apparent from the way that the particular social group is described whether it meets this requirement. And as an example, the court cited the group 
women who fear being forced into prostitution, although that description would appear to define the particular social group based on the harm alleged women who are forced into prostitution could very well share some of the protected characteristics, such as political views, and that could make them more vulnerable to be victims of the alleged harm. And thus it was important for the decision maker to examine the specific facts of the case before them. Now taking the particular social group that was at issue in the matter of AB, El Salvadoran women who are unable to leave their domestic relationships when they have children in common. The court posited that the women in this group may suffer from constraints on divorce, and thus the group may not be defined based on the harm, domestic violence, at all. It could be defined on specific characteristics found within the particular culture at issue, and whether a particular group was circular would depend on the facts in the case. In fact, the court noted that during oral argument, the government conceded that the group, Guatemalan women unable to leave their relationships, could not be categorically barred from receiving asylum. Rather, whether this was an appropriate particular social group would depend on the specific facts present in the case, the point apparently being that this is a case-by-case -case analysis that does not turn exclusively on how the group is stated in a single sentence. Rather, the decision maker was required to engage in a detailed analysis of the society from which the women came and the particular constraints on their freedom that may exist in that society. In that case, there was a party that had filed an amicus curiae brief. Now, amicus curiae essentially means friend of the court. What happens is when there is a case that the court knows could have far-reaching consequences based on the rule of law that could result from the decision, the court will allow non-parties to file briefs to give their point of view in order to inform the court's decision. In this case, the amicus curiae filed a brief arguing that often domestic violence is not simply a private matter based on personal animosity, and that rather it flows from gender-based norms and the need to control women in certain places in the world. There could be cultural, religious, and political norms that treat women as if they were property rightfully belonging to the persecutor. The amicus curiae argued that the analysis must examine the roots of the gender-based violence. Again, during oral argument, the government conceded that despite the Attorney General's language that generally few claims of domestic violence or even gang-related violence would qualify for asylum, there was no categorical rule that prevented such claims from receiving asylum. Now, the result of the Grace decision by the D.C. Circuit was a mixed bag. On the one hand, the D.C. Circuit declined to approve of the preliminary injunction that would have prevented the enforcement of the rule that appeared to flow from Attorney General Sessions' decision in matter of A.B. But on the other hand, this case should be used to emphasize both to immigration judges and to the asylum officers that there is no categorical bar to victims of domestic violence from receiving asylum in the United States. Rather, the job of the advocate is going to be to present evidence of the characteristics present within the society from which the applicant comes that demonstrate why women may be particularly vulnerable to domestic violence. It will need to be more than just the fact that this country has a problem policing domestic violence. Now, when we're talking about the societies in Central America, particularly the societies in the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, the problem of domestic violence is usually deeply entrenched. 
It involves cultural and religious norms that treat women akin to property to be controlled by the man in the relationship. It involves the ingrained reluctance of men in power to take the allegations of domestic violence seriously, despite the fact that there are laws on the books which on their face criminalize domestic violence. Practitioners should be well advised that they will need a great deal of evidence on the status of women in these societies, evidence that is detailed and credible. It is evidence that will almost certainly require trained and qualified experts in the field offering detailed and credible opinions on the subject of domestic violence in the particular society at issue in your case. In this regard, I've worked with the Hastings Institute Center for Gender and Refugee Studies. They have been willing to assist practitioners with affidavits from such experts. The problem is that some of these affidavits are somewhat aged, maybe a decade old or so by now. And while they are persuasive to some immigration judges, other immigration judges have been reviewing these affidavits for years and looking for whatever minor weaknesses in or out of context they could point to in order to use them against the respondent. And the DC Circuit isn't the only circuit court that saw the issue in this same manner. The Ninth Circuit, in the case of Diaz Reynoso versus William Barr, also held that the matter of AB did not create a categorical bar involving domestic violence and gang based violence claims for asylum. Instead, the Ninth Circuit said that the Attorney General was merely reaffirming the BIA's existing framework that the analysis of what constitutes a particular social group must be made on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at the individual facts in each case. So as we immigration attorneys continue to fight for women who are victims of domestic abuse, it is critical that as practitioners, we hold the government to the concessions that they made in these cases. And that is, attorneys who represent victims of domestic violence in immigration court should repeatedly point out that the government itself has agreed that there is no categorical rule against victims of domestic violence and victims of gang-based violence from receiving asylum. Practitioners must also redouble their efforts in creating a thorough record containing expert testimony regarding the status of women in these certain societies and how they make women vulnerable to the widespread domestic violence that's present in these societies where the government there will not intervene on the woman's behalf. Nonetheless, these two cases from the two different courts of appeals, Grace and Diaz Reynosa, they drive home the vital importance in driving the Republicans and the Trump administration out of office. The Trump administration has done widespread damage on immigration laws in general. It is part of their effort to attack not only undocumented aliens, but also legal immigration. And if the Democrats are able to take back all three of the policy-making branches of government in the upcoming election, pressure needs to be placed on the Democratic Party to address the various actions that Donald Trump and his cronies have taken that damage the flow of legal immigration into this country. For example, it could be vital to take those regulations that were proposed in 1999 and reissue them in this time finalizing them so we can secure the status of abused women when it comes to making an asylum claim. Under a Biden administration, it will be time to finally stop kicking the various issues involved in immigration reform down the road and address subjects such as the status of domestic violence victims in immigration courts. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there are any topics you would like me to address in the future, please let me know in the comments below. Now, I don't like talking about this, but I am currently disabled because of complications following cancer surgery. 
If you're feeling generous, I'll have a link to my PayPal account in the description below.